screen, but in case we do, there, I have typed to start. <laughs> you don't have me stumping about uh, mountains, mountain passes, but all right, let me yeah. share my screen. Oh no, not the dreaded, you don't have system permissions to share your screen message. Oh no. You know the but. No, because then it's going to tell me that I have to quit Zoom and rejoin. Oh, oh no. The whole thing is starting to fit. Let me try this again. I might be back momentarily. We might have to do another start button. Oh, there you <laughs> go. See, but it, it tells you you have to restart, but like you don't. And I don't really understand it. <laughs> but okay, so this is fake tables. Ah, I thought it might be that. Yeah. Um, I've been working on it for a little bit at work, but it is open source. So anyone is welcome to use it or contribute. Um, it's my first like bigger open source project at work. I've made a few contributions, but yeah. Um, so the whole idea was that you've got all these different packages in shiny, like DT and reactable that let you interact with tables in shiny but they're all sort of kind of weird in like their own way <laughs> where dt if you edit a value in a column then it returns the entire column and doesn't tell you which cell has been changed which isn't that hard to figure out but it's just kind of like that's a little weird and then reactable if you change a value it will just tell you the cell reference so it will give you like a row and column number and then the new value which again it works but it's kind of weird and then the input options are a little limited um and then just sort of what you can do with it and then if you're trying to write back to a database those input how those inputs are returned back starts becoming a little bit of a hurdle where you now need to figure out okay which rows were actually updated for like a rows update. Or if you add rows to the data, then you're now tracking which ones are added and which ones are removed. And it starts becoming a whole thing. And so the idea was that you could create an object that would manage a fake table for you. And the table is made up of shiny inputs arranged into a grid pattern to give the idea of a table. And that's why it's called a fake table because it's really <laughs> just a bunch of shiny fluid rows with columns in it. Um, and so I built it out and it's now a shiny module that you can drop in to whatever you want. Um, it is so far experimental. There's still a few smaller things I'm working out, but there is a live demo on shiny apps. Um, Jared, my boss has a bunch of data sets on his personal site. And so this is his top 10 favorite pizza places mm -hmm. in no particular order in New York City. Um, some of them are closed, actually, because he hasn't updated the, uh, the data set in a while. And so the, if, John, you know Jared, but uh, Jared <laughs> is sort of convinced that New York City is the best city on the planet and everything else is basically like a garbage heap. <laughs> And so I figured if if Jared had uh, rated these pizza places, then of course every pizza place in New York City is going to be at least an eleven <laughs> out of ten because it's in New York City. And so I made mean, there's a whole bunch of little inputs you can have that it's totally up to you, the user, to make. Uh, the map is also up to the user, but the table at the bottom is all generated dynamically from the data and a specification that you pass to the um, server function. And I'll, I'll show you how it works in a little bit. But for example, so you've got Defara Pizza, you can change the address if you want. And so if I was able to find Defara Pizza down in Brooklyn, and I change it to 1424 one, Avenue I don't know, Q, I, someone's getting mad at me in New York City, be like, Avenue Q doesn't exist in Brooklyn, you dumb dumb but that's fine. Um, and if I really <laughs> want to mess with them, I could be like, oh, that's the Bronx now. And I don't know if you guys can see, but it's changing the values in the little 
tooltip because the tooltip is referencing the table down here. And then if you really want, I went a little bit extra and made it so that when you change the rating, it changes the size of the marker, which was designed to look like a little cheese pizza. So <laughs> just a, a little bit of style points for myself there. But how does it all work, you say? And that's a great question because I have a whole vignette that talks about it. Um, I'll start at the bottom, actually, because I think it's the more interesting part, and then I'll go up. So you have your classic shiny whoop, um, UI and server. And so in the UI, the only thing we're adding is this fake tables UI call. And that you put where in the UI you want your table to be. And so if you want it at the top of the page, you put it at the top of the page. If you don't, you don't. But um, that is where. Oh, I may have messed that up a little bit. This app, this app may not be the same. This is not the same one. Okay. <laughs> so this app, if I were to run it, it is basically just a little example. And I can actually pull it up and show you so that you're not like, why is this different? Um, big tables, run all. Oh, boo. <laughs> Sorry, guys. This is what I get. Um, but okay, so this this little demo app is it uses empty cars and it has a table at the top of the page, and then a simple thing to add um, a new vehicle with some data, and then at the bottom it shows you the actual tables in the back end, and so I'm gonna let that run in the background. But then in the server, all you need, if you're not going to be inserting new data. All you need is this fake table server call where your fake table is referencing the object that you've made earlier and then reassigning it back. This isn't necessarily best practice to call it the same thing, but the idea is that it is the same thing, even though <laughs> this is a regular fake tables object and this is a reactive version of a fake tables object. Um, and then if you're inserting data, you call fake tables insert. I don't know why I prefixed this one and not the other ones. But <laughs> um, you, you pass it F tab from up here and the new data you want to insert. And then this will modify the F tab object back in the server environment with the new inserted data. Um, and then you can just run the app like normal. And so let's see. Oh, do I not even have one? Oh. Um, sorry, guys. <laughs> this, uh, this is a pattern I use constantly. If I'm like, I don't know what packages I need, RN will grab the dependencies for you. And then you can just list out all the unique ones because there will be duplicates and then install all of them. If you don't care about versioning, which is the whole point of RN, it's a great thing to do. Mm -hmm. uh, but to go back up to the top, if we're starting out with empty cars, I'm just going to grab it, make it shorter, uh, use row names to column to put the row names in, in as a column. And then I'm rounding the quarter second time to um, a range with whole numbers. So the quarter second times an empty car has come through is like 14.6. And so I want that to be 14 to 15, um, just for the sake of this demonstration. And then I'm selecting my four columns that I actually care about. Then for each column you want to display, you create a column definition with call def. Um, and you pass it the name of that column, an input call, which is a bare function call to a shiny input, and then a list of arguments that you need to pass to that input. And notably, you don't pass an input ID. And even if you did, it would get overwritten because I need that to track all of the inputs in the uh, table. A cast, unfortunately, again, there's one more little downside, which is that anything that comes back through the input list 
I end up losing its class. And so you need an as dot whatever or as underscore whatever to put it back to what it's supposed to be. Um, and so for characters, numerics, and integers, that's mostly okay. For some data types, that might not be the safest thing. If you want to change the width of the column, and then if you want to give it a nice, pretty display name instead of using the actual column name. And then you can pass all of these. You can put them all in a list, or you can pass them directly to table def, which just creates a nicely formatted tibble with all of these uh, definitions in it. And then you take your data, your table definition. Um, if you have a primary key already, that's great. I won't try and duplicate it. And you just tell me what it is. If you don't have one, then row ID you can leave as null. And I'll just try my best to make one. Mm -hmm. And then show delete is an, can be an empty list, or you can format it depending on how you want that delete column to remove rows to show up. And then again, you just drop fake tables UI in there and nice. Okay, so I should now be able to, oh, just kidding. I have to actually install it because I didn't prefix anything. Okay, cool. So now if I were to run this little test app, whoops, um, sorry guys, I realized my screen's <laughs> kind of big. Okay, so if you run this test app, then you can see I have my first six rows from empty cars. I've got a, the vehicle name, miles per gallon, cylinder, and then the quarter second time is this range of about two. Uh, we can add a row, and then at the very bottom, it's showing you what the back end of fake tables actually looks like. And so right now, there's just plain data. Nothing's been inserted, nothing's been updated, and nothing's been deleted. But if we modify this valiant to say having four cylinders, now if I look at my updated table, it shows up here. And in the original data table, the cylinder now says four, which is great. If we want to add John's Datamobile, which gets a very impressive three miles per gallon <laughs> on four cylinders and has a very slow quarter second range of 22 to 25 seconds. We can add that in. And now my data, oh, my data appears to have lost John's data mobile, which is a little problematic, but it shows in the inserted column. I think I know what happened too, but um, it shows up in the inserted and then our updated still has the valiant. And then if we were to delete, John's data, actually, let's do a different one. Well, if we delete John's data mobile, then it's no longer in the inserted rows, which is pretty nice because it's not like it was inserted and then deleted. It, according to the database on the back end, that row never existed because I never wrote it to the database. Uh, and then if we go delete the Valiant, it should disappear from updated. And it does, and it's now in the deleted and no longer in here. So that that pretty much is the entirety whoops, of fake tables. Um, there's a few fun things because it's an S7 class. Um, let's see. So if you wanted to insert data, you do you have the insert table, but then because it's an S7 class, there's actually another function called insert, which is used on the back end, which is how I'm inserting data. But if for whatever reason you're like, I want to use fake tables not in a shiny app, I mean, okay, go for it. But then you can use this insert generic to add that new wow. data. Um, if you want to write to a database, it's pretty much the same. The idea is just that at some point you have to connect to your database. Uh, I have a convenience function called DB write table that will use the appropriate rows insert, rows update, and rows delete to match the backend insert, update, and delete tables and fake tables. 
to that database and then you just have to disconnect. Um, it's nothing crazy there. And then this one will also, because with like John's data mobile, it was written to the table, removed from the table, but never written to the database. So this will also refresh the session so that the FTAB object now knows that John's data mobile is part of the original data now from the database. So now if you were to delete it after inserting, it would show up in the deleted call in the deleted table. Um, and then there's really the functions that user the users use is creating the fake table. And to do that, it's these three. If you wanted to implement it, we've got these four for the UI server inserting and writing to the database. And then my, I'm not sure manipulate is necessarily the best term for this, <laughs> but to insert update or delete your rows, and then we can validate it using um, is input call, is call def, is table def, and is fake table, uh, just to make sure everything is what it says it is. And that's mostly just used for the, uh, code coverage and the tests, which I did my best, but if you want to play around with it and you break something, please, by all means, submit an issue on GitHub. Um, but that, yeah, that's pretty much, <laughs> that is fake tables. So yeah, you can, it's not on CRAN yet. You can install it with your GitHub installation method of choice. Here I used pack. You could use dev tools, I think. Does it? Yeah, dev tools. You could <laughs> clone it from GitHub and install it manually. You could download the zip file from GitHub and do that. If, do whatever floats your boat. But yeah, that's fake tables. Very cool. Yep. <laughs> It is, it, it amuses, the name amuses me because, yeah. you know, I mean, is anything really canonically a table? <laughs> yeah, I, this little logo, I took a piece of clip art and traced it <laughs> using just like the dash lines on Google drawings at like two in the morning one <laughs> night because I couldn't sleep. And I was like, I'm going to do this. I had spent like three hours earlier trying to design this like cool glass table thing in blender after having never touched blender before <laughs> and it wasn't really working i didn't know what i was doing and i was getting frustrated so i was like all right clip art it is and I, I honestly i think this probably came out a little bit better than like the cool glass table thing would have so yep deal with it um sorry gabby i just saw your question um so the theming is pretty much up to the user for the table because we pass through those, sorry, those input calls. Whoops, where is it? The input calls get passed to whatever your shiny input is. And so long as you can pass it there, it's totally up to you. And then in the column definition, I also take dynamic dots and this will get passed to the shiny column dots. So it's, I'm trying to pass through as much as I can to shiny to let shiny take care of it. But uh, the one thing I did really need to make sure that users were giving me was the width there. If you leave it out, I believe actually no. sorry. That's on the, um, <laughs> Here, I can show you the, on the show delete, if you leave show delete empty, that defaults to a width of two. But for the actual user's data, it's, you have to tell me what you want. And that is mostly just to try and manage it because data can be different widths. So if you have a text field, you probably want a lighter column than just like a number. Um, and I also believe I leave all of the enforcing of the total. So like all the widths have to add up to 12. I'm pretty sure I'm leaving all of the enforcement of that to shiny. 
So it'll I'll let Shiny yell at you if <laughs> it wants to. But, yep. Um, let's see. Yeah, that's that is it. Very very cool. No worries, <laughs> Gabby. It's all good. I'm I'm just glad you joined. So. All right. Well, are you uh, ready to go, Lydia? We lost Gabby. Yeah, yeah. I was just kind of working on it a bit. <laughs> was, oh. Yeah, it's very much a work in progress. And I also did not just practice the PR, so it's going to be fun. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let's see. I'll just share my desktop. Okay, yeah, so how do I make this? Okay, so something that Ken and I have been working on for like, um, or were working on while we were, um, while we were co-facilitating the R4DS book club um, was making like a book club, um, book club facilitator training guide or as Ken put it, book club facilitator field manual. And mostly the goal of it was mostly like a lot of it is kind of like be able to make the book clubs more sustainable and also lessen the load that John carries right now. I think at the moment we have like eight book clubs running at once and usually it could be like 10 to 15. And I think he said the most was probably maybe at one time 20 book clubs running at a time. And it's not really feasible or sustainable for one person to be reviewing the PRs for all the book clubs each week. Um, so yeah, so we wanna kind of share the load and in addition to the current book club facilitator duties, have the book club facilitators also review the PRs for their book. Um, because also they'll know when the PRs are in, they'll know what's going on in the book club meetings and stuff like that. Um, so yeah, so right now we have it in a Google Doc and just now is trying to kind of put some stuff into an actual book. This is actually working. Yeah, so I just started kind of trying to put some of the stuff Ken made into a book and none of the pictures are showing up, uh, but I'll figure that out later. Um, but yeah, so the main things are kind of like Firstly, you want your book club facilitators. Oh, and also another note about being able to have the book club facilitators do this as well. Um, something we've wanted to do with um, is like be able to allow having more book clubs, um, allowing the ability to have more book clubs running at once. Because again, if we have more than one person reviewing PRs, that's something that we're able to do. And also like, we now have the funds to be able to um, have more than one Zoom account. But as of right now, we're not using a second Zoom account because we can't really um, host that many book clubs yet. But that is our goal, set up that second Zoom account so we could have at least two book clubs could have like a meeting at the same time because there are some times that are like are better for people to meet. But if one book club already has that, then yeah, that time slot, you can only use it for one book club. So these are just ways we want to be able to make the, make the community better, give people more options to have book clubs and stuff like that. So yeah, so one of the main things to be able to, um, yeah, so to be able to even begin, uh, let me go over here, to even begin like, being able to review the PRs for a book club, you need to be like watching. Oh, I should get rid of that. You need to be watching the book club so that you get the notifications about any emails for PRs and stuff like that. I have no idea. Okay. okay. I'll figure that out later. Um, what else is Ken have in here? Yeah, watching it, you want to watch all of the activity. And then, yeah, so the main thing will be being able to have facilitators manage the pull requests for their clubs 
So one of the first things they'll have to do is learning to access the pull requests. Uh, let me see what this one was. So actually we do right now have one PR for ClickClub RPDS. So you find the PR like down here, you can click that. And then you see, this is the PR, it's PR number 146. And someone updated, oh, Gabby, <laughs> was it? Yeah, it looks like Gabby updated the slides for chapter 28, um, which is Quarto of the RPDS book club. Um, just looking at the comments in the chat. Um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, so yeah, so the PRs, they're merging because they need to be reviewed. Someone needs to review the, um, the book before it's um, merged and stuff like that. Sorry, I did not, I'm doing this presentation on the fly, so <laughs> bear with me. <laughs> um, okay. Let's go back to Ken's material. That's not Ken's, that's mine. This is Ken's. Okay. So, and yeah, we can see the files that were updated. Okay. So you see, we have one commit. It's this commit that Gabby made. And it'll show you the different changes that Gabby made. Well, actually, this will show you. I think both of them do the same thing. Yeah, it shows you the files that were changed um, and also the changes that were made. Um, so you can see, like, the green stuff is what was added, the red stuff is what was removed. We have some images that were added, it looks like. Yeah. So, what is it? So, yeah. So, what you want to do is first you have to have the book in your, your local art your local art studio. So the first thing to do with that, you're gonna want to use the package use this. And what you're gonna do is create some book club and you wanna create a fork. And hopefully this works. Okay, so you put that in the, I think this is use this. Let's see. Sweet, okay. So yeah, so now I'm cloning the repo and it's opening up in a fourth R studio. <laughs> And it's just gonna, it's not gonna clone like specifically that PR. It's gonna show you what's already in the book. So this is what should be on the website right now. Yeah, so this one we didn't, I guess my cohort, which was cohort nine, we didn't fill this out, it looks like. It was what was formerly there from the R markdown, like from RFDS first edition when it was our markdown. So what we want to do next, we want to access Gabby's PR. And as you saw, Gabby's PR number is 146. So we're also gonna use, use this again. And what we're gonna do is use the PR fetch. It's the PR fetch um, function or whatever you call it. Uh, oops. Okay, so use this PR fetch. I believe that was one four six. Let me. I don't think that will matter, but <laughs> if it's okay. Okay, um, okay. So then you'll see that it switches to um, it's switches to like Gabby's actual, Gabby's copy of it, which includes her PR. Um, I think it'll take a moment before it tells me that it's Gabby. But that should change, I believe, if I'm correct. I haven't done this in a while, so maybe <laughs> it does not. Okay. Which, I guess which, sorry, what, 
what did you expect to change? Uh, where it says main. Uh, so, so maybe it she... is main, but it's Gabby's anyway. Yeah, Gabby didn't oh, okay. create a branch oh, okay, when okay. she created this, so. Oh, okay, no worries. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, so if it well, was wait, the well, new. No, it, it. Why is it? Click the circle arrow up there uh, to this. the right. Nope, all the way to the, the right. The refresh. This. Yeah. Oh, there okay. you go. Okay, yeah. yeah, so it should change and That's tell you. A little like, weird that it didn't, but. Whose branch it is. Yeah, so it shouldn't have the name. I think it's still on thing. But yeah, it'll tell you whose branch it is, and I'm on like Gabby's branch. So yeah, so again, I want to look at the file, Porto 28. And the thing, the reason, even though you can see what files were updated on GitHub, you also want to make sure that the book can like commit on your local machine. So that's what I'm, so you want to download it to your local machine and make sure it knits um, and that you have no issues with it because uh, I wonder if that has to do with, oh, sorry. You still have to go through all the steps that are in the normal book clubs. Uh, I don't think I, I don't have all the packages downloaded, so that's an issue. Oh, wrong thing. Yeah, I have to download all the packages. One second. I really should update all these instructions to use pack because you can just type uh, pack pack if you uh, use pack. No, oh, oh, you don't have dev tools. Dev tools. <laughs> Okay. Installing dev tools is never a quick process. Actually, I should have it. Do I not have it already? I'm guessing you installed or um, you upgraded I R. Have it. Oh, I definitely did. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and I have not participated in a book club <laughs> yep. since doing that. Uh, I don't know how long this will take. Hopefully, it's not. Oh, okay, it wasn't too long. Library, dev tools. Then what was I trying to do before? I think I was just trying to knit this. Okay, hopefully now it should knit. It did not. Why? You still that? don't have book down. I have to. Now, uh, now you have to do the. Oh, uh, I didn't. The thing Sorry. you're trying to. Yeah. <laughs> okay. I totally forgot. One more step. Okay. Now use do dev tools to download all of the. All of the packages that are already in like the description. Because yeah, the book won't the book won't run locally if I don't have all of these packages, basically. So I'm okay, yeah. It is book down is listed. I was like, you book down's low level enough. I was worried that maybe there was something else weird going on, but no, it's all good. Okay. <laughs> so hopefully that is everything. And yay, live demos. <laughs> <laughs> This will all be stuff I can make sure I add into the notes. Yeah, they'll be um, they'll be slightly different soon, but I will make sure to make updates about that because uh, I'm doing the Cordial Formats chapter next week, and it yeah. seems appropriate for that to be the moment that we switch this repo over to Cordo. and okay. so everything will be a little bit different, but close enough to the same. Okay. Geez, I have no idea. I hope this is almost done. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, unfortunately. Uh, well, actually, a lot of these are pretty low level, like packages that you would have if you had used, you know, tidyverse or things like that, or uh, yeah. at least I don't know. There's some, like that's some ggplot stuff there. Um, yeah. but there are some specials for sure. Yeah, because I think I. Well, it's a lot of data things. Sometime in April. Sometime in April, and we definitely finished the book club in mm -hmm. April. So potentially it was in May. You probably updated I, like right after you finished the book club. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, the worst thing you can do is update like during the book club, and then, oh crap, none of this is working. <laughs> 
Okay, sweet. Everything is downloaded. So hopefully this should now knit. Dear God, please knit. <laughs> okay, looks like we're in business. I see a warning. Hopefully that won't stop me. It should be fine. It's just interesting that it happened. Okay, so we have our book and we have the quarto chapter. So yeah, so basically you want to look through everything, um, make sure everything looks good. And it's Gabby, so I'm sure everything looks good. I've reviewed some of her PRs already, so yeah. I probably don't need to go, well, actually I will go through everything because I do need to merge those. Oops, what did I do? And so far, so good. And I'm sure John also saw this because he was in the book club. Figures, almost done. I'm going to see some comments. Let's change this. I don't think, okay, so I'm reading Gabby's comment. It still has a lot of words. Please, let's go over it and suggest changes. Okay, so I can do it like a, if you, I don't know. I don't think it looks bad, like having too many words. I think the slides are, I don't know. I'll let John be the judge. Yeah, I was muted. Of uh, We have it. Uh, a little bit in the guide and that's some language that we need to set uh clean up i think for facilitators of really what we're approving based on is is this better than what was there and there was nothing there therefore this is almost certainly good to go um yeah with the understanding that the idea is that each club it should get better um and so if someone submits a poll request and i, I have seen this where they they want to do their own slides then that's fine but the slides they do are less useful, less informative than what was already there, then, you know, I'll go back and forth with them a little, or maybe say, you know, sorry, um, I, we prefer the slides that are exist or something. But, you know, that that's really the only rule is it has to work and has to be better than, yeah. well, which I guess it's better than what is there. Working would be part of that. So <laughs> it's really just yeah. that one rule. Um, yeah. And then we have some other guidelines in the, the guides there of things to specifically check for, like giant data sets. Uh, we try and, you know, don't merge those in because then it's slow for everybody. Um, even if they're not working in that chapter that has the giant data set. So um, things like that, we have little rules in the guide. Uh, there are definitely a few, I, I think, you know, I haven't, <laughs> I haven't had time to go through and review these. To, and I think there's a little bit just to kind of like with the slides of make it a little bit easier for someone to start. Um, so we need to cut out some of the wordiness, I think, but mm -hmm. the idea is there. And we definitely need to um, have the instructions so people can come in and do it. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it's better than what was there. Can I, can I say something? I don't know. If if you guys can hear me yeah barely but yes oh my goodness okay sorry i'm in the car <laughs> um i think that one thing that could help because i love this thing that dj is presenting i think we do need something like this to guide the future um leaders of a cohort i don't know what to call them um but one thing that could be useful is there was an example of so this is what the text looks like in the book. This is what an example of how the slide could look like. We still a lot of work, and this is what we're looking for, right? Like less work. So if I could have something like to compare and say, oh yeah, so this example, even though it's less than what the book has, still too wordy because it's too wordy. What what does that mean, right? But if I could compare it to an example of something where you have 
actually set it down to an acceptable level, then I can have that as a guide or something to, um, to I don't know, to have like in the back of my mind and say, okay, that's the goal. Hope that makes sense. Yeah. Um, no, go ahead. Sorry. Okay. Oh, no. Oh, I was just going to recap to make sure I heard what you're saying. You're saying like kind of, kind of like having a guide of, okay, this is, this slide is too long, the slide isn't too long. Was that kind of it? John or Gabby? Exactly, uh, something like that. Yeah, I, th yeah, I think having some um, examples, like this is what's in the book. This is a slide that has kind of the right representation of that thing in the book. And this has a little too much. Mm -hmm. um, so that to help people find that sweet spot. Um, I think, like that's the next level of what I want to do with this. Um, yeah. And really for everybody kind of having that training material available would be nice. But it's also, you know, again, I want to stress like, you know, you've seen some of my reviews. And so you are, um, you're in that thought process of making the slides um, what I consider perfect. And that isn't necessarily what we're going for. We want slides that are good enough and that people can then work from there. Um, so I don't want to slow down this process of getting more people helping by aiming for perfect. We're just aiming for better. Um, and then we'll keep working towards perfect. Yeah. Yeah. And I think one of the <laughs> things John pointed out about the slides is one of the main things, we don't want people to put what's in the book word for word. That right. could bring up legal issues, <laughs> and also it kind of defeats the purpose of having the notes if you're just actually looking at the book itself, but in a different place. Um, but yeah, so it's not about it being perfect, and we don't necessarily want the facilitators to keep going back and forth with the learners, like, hey, this isn't perfect, do this perfect. It's like, is it better? <laughs> okay, well, let's let's move on from there kind of thing. But yeah, it's not to slow it down. That's definitely not the goal of it. Yeah, so okay, so once we have seen that we are able to render the book locally, that's all we have to do here. Um, so we could do use this. PR finish. And I don't think I have to put anything in there. I think to just close it out and go back to the main. Yeah, and really, um you don't necessarily even need to do the download local step. And so that's some stuff that we need to go over because mm -hmm. if, if the, if it's building remotely, mm -hmm. um, I guess you want to look at it. I guess that's why we had that in there. Um, yeah. yeah, I need to work on, so I know I, I have learned with package down sites, how to deploy both the dev version and the production version into GitHub pages. I needed to see if I could do that with these book down sites because then that's you know the the main reason to download it is so you can actually see the slides as deployed slides. Yeah. Um because you can tell that it rent, you know, it doesn't break <laughs> by just looking at the pull request on GitHub and seeing that the action didn't fail. But that's not the same as it, it like looks, you know, you're you're looking for. Um, oh, clearly they meant for this to be a new slide, but it's uh, broken. And so there isn't a new slide there or things like that. That's really what you're aiming for on the download. I'm yeah. thinking out loud here, uh, but yeah, as part of the GitHub or the Quarto setup, if I could figure out how to um, basically have at the site for the book, have a like slash PR and you could put in a number and it would have the deployed book for that PR. Um, I might play around with that. And then you don't need it locally unless you're trying to like debug it, which does come up sometimes, but I, you know, I want to make this as easy to do as possible so that we can get more help. I was looking for, I don't see it. Maybe I'm looking at the wrong thing. Okay. Cause I think I understand what you're saying. I was like, so I helped with the I helped with making the Cascadia R um, website. I'm trying to look 
I don't know how to find my old PR. Or is it my? Oh, my pull request. That should work. Too close. So like, kind of like, like this one is built with Netlify. So there's like a way to preview it. Is that kind of what you meant, John? Um, not, oh, am I? Yeah, oh, we not quite, I'm trying to, yeah. One moment, I'm trying to get an example. Uh, um, okay. Yeah, that doesn't work, but this will be close enough. So you go to, um, Oh, I'm still sharing, I think. Yeah, I'm just going to put it in the chat. Oh, then. okay. Uh, so um, Garrick Aiden Bowie from uh, Posit has this package epoxy. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that's pretty cool. That's the book down website for the, the package. But mm -hmm. if you go to that URL, that's the same book down, but uh, it's the dev build versus the other one was the release build. And I was hoping he doesn't have, um, or at least I couldn't find it, but he has a, a GitHub action in there where when there's a pull request that edits the book down, then the book down deploys as that pull request as well. So you like, I thought he would have it at like slash dev slash PR and then the number of the pull request, but that didn't actually work. So um I need to see, uh, you know, I need to, to dig more to see how he does that. But I know um, he does have some some setup with that. Okay. Okay. But yeah, okay. So that would be really cool. Yeah. Because, yeah, I know, like, when we were doing, when I was working on the Cascadia site, like, Netlify gives you an option to, like, preview. So... Lots of people have that, but number one, like Netlify has, isn't always free and mm. it's a whole other setup. So uh, yeah. some people use Netlify for their, either use the Netlify for dev and GitHub pages for production or vice versa. Mm. But um, we probably <laughs> could yeah. just uh, don't make it. That. Yeah. It, I, it, that's like all kinds of extra work because you have to learn two systems. Yeah, I would rather have yeah. it all in the one place. So yeah, okay. We'll see. Uh, Cloudflare does another; they do it too. But that's the third system. So <laughs> I don't. The okay. thing I don't know. I've never used Nel Nelify, but I know Cloudflare. You can hook it directly to a GitHub project or like yep. a GitHub repo. You can with Nelify too. Okay. Yeah, but. You can do you can manage it all from GitHub if you use GitHub pages. So I'd rather just use GitHub pages yeah. for the whole thing. Yeah. And we're already using GitHub pages. And the idea is like we would deploy the site at whatever the main URL. And then also if you go to slash dev or slash PR or something like that, we'll deploy the individual versions. Um I need to play with that a little bit because I don't necessarily want to deploy. You know, if the site's gigantic, I don't want to um, build it or have it twice. Well, no, because then the, the trick was when the PR is closed, you can also automatically delete the pull request version of the site. And so it's just there while the pull request is being reviewed. Because um, right now we, we do build the book down for the slides, but we don't um, put them anywhere that you can look at. And so all it's doing is checking that it doesn't break, um, which is, you know, sometimes enough, but I'd rather also check that it looks how you expect it to look. Yeah. Yeah. Well, so, I've, anyway, I've never hopefully coming soon. Yeah. I have no idea how the release and stuff work, so I'll definitely leave that to you to figure <laughs> out. <laughs> it is. Okay. Um, easier than you would expect, hmm. especially if you just yeah. use GitHub pages. So yeah, that was, um, if you're ever, page. <laughs> if you're ever working on a package, I put this yeah. off forever. And then I found the, um, use this, what is it? Use GitHub or use, yeah. 
let me find it. Package down. There we go. So if you're if you have a package, that command does all of the steps for setting up a package down for the yeah. um for your package, like in, you know, the deployment, setting up the GitHub action, it does everything. And I had like set aside a day, like, okay, I'm gonna finally learn how to use package down. And then I ran that command and I'm like, oh. And now I have learned how to use package down. <laughs> like <laughs> you did all of the steps. <laughs> okay. Yeah. There's also um for previewing, at least locally, there's the package down build site GitHub pages. It, yes. But Which, if again, you don't have the action is nice. Right. Which, but the, yeah, my point is that I, I want it to be when a pull request is submitted. The people reviewing it, like, don't have to install all the packages. Yeah. Um, that yeah. GitHub will install all the packages, and then you'll be able to look at it. Because, you know, that's all we care about is that those slides look like slides. We don't want yeah. the people reviewing to be doing or to have to debug how to install things. Um, mm -hmm. and so that's what I'm aiming at. And hopefully, we'll be able to get there the more, I, like, I did this for my new job and just this week. And so I've been reading all about, oh, the double deployment. And actually I, the like the GitHub actions are really easy now because um it's like there are two different ways to do it, but either way you do it, um it's really simple to get GitHub to deploy a site. I, if they want it to be as easy as possible. All right, go ahead. What? I vaguely recall having a double deployment with Cloudflare. And I just don't remember what <laughs> I'm thinking of, but I'm like pretty sure I did it. So I'm, I'm cracking open my dash to see if I can figure out what I did. <laughs> One thing I will say, John, the only thing is like if the facilitator is reviewing a PR for the book they're already doing, they should mostly already have all the packages yeah. downloaded. They were like, there is that. Yeah. 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 Um, yeah. I just want to make it as easy as possible to review. And so yeah. having the site already built and you don't yeah. have to rebuild it yourself, I think can be yeah. very helpful. Yeah. Um, and then, you know, the actual review can focus on the GitHub side where you're just looking at the files and making sure, um, you know, suggesting edits directly and all that kind of stuff where you do it just yeah. within GitHub like we have in the the docs. So the one thing is like so for me if I was just reviewing this like the actual files I don't know if that's necessarily easier. I don't know if it's necessarily easier to I mean, you'll also you'll I, also have the deployed site. Can I? Yeah. Still, so you, steal the screen share real quick. Sure. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Because it, I found the setting, and wait, I can't find the screen share button though. Zoom. What is this? There it is. <laughs> okay. So this is my Cloudflare. Um, there's two options. You can configure the main deployment from a specific branch, and then they have preview deployments that you can configure from all non-production branches or like custom branches. I don't know. I mean, I guess I, I can. I, I, again, like adding you, you PR to deployments to thing. what we already have. Right. Yeah. I don't, no, I I don't want to do that. It's, but, it, yeah. it's not going to be hard. I just need to sit down and do it. Yeah. <laughs> I think it would be good to see, like, I feel like I would want to try, like, to see how it is the other way and see if I like that better, especially coming from <laughs> someone who's still very, fairly, well, comparatively new to GitHub, like, comparatively right. definitely new to GitHub. So I'm also wondering, like, from my perspective or someone who is, newer to GitHub, but more so familiar with our studio, if that is, yeah. I'm, okay, I, I just, I don't think, you're gonna have to do all the GitHub steps also. Yeah. So 
I don't think having the R studio in the middle can be easier <laughs> because more so for me you it's still more so like being able to see everything. Like when I'm looking at this, I don't I'm not seeing like I don't know how to describe it. It's seeing how everything actually looks like this versus we can't see know. your screen right now you're not sharing oh. but <laughs> oh, okay yeah i don't know I guess you I mean the rendered thing like, or the code like to actually be able to look at the code and be able to tell the person oh this is what you did wrong because i can look at the file what you what you did in your file and kind of let you know hey this is how you can change it you can do that on our or on github though and you can't yeah. Like you can see what you want to say, but you can't actually say it through our studio versus on GitHub. Yeah. You just click the little plus. Yeah. Uh, and well, so I don't I don't use the side by side layout. I use if you go to I don't remember this ever being a thing that I set up. So what where is it? Yeah, if you go to the top of your page, well, the gear icon. Yeah. Okay. Right there. And go to unified. Ah. I find that easier to see. Um, oh okay yeah oh, potentially uh, like can I, I can, so can you go get back. rid of the red stuff can you get rid of like what's red or you still have to look at it like this um I think I mean I wouldn't recommend getting rid of the red because then you wouldn't know that they had deleted things and they yeah. might have deleted something important and so uh, yeah I, I'm guessing that's why they don't but anyway um I, there are arguments for both ways of looking at it but i like this just because it, it's very narrow <laughs> if it's yeah. uh, side by side i guess if you have a big monitor it can work to have the side by side and um yeah. anyway uh like if you have to actually run the code then yeah, you'll yeah. want that locally. If you're trying to figure out, wait, what are they trying to do here? This code doesn't make sense, that kind of thing. Um, but mm -hmm. if you, you know, if you have the the actual rendered slides, I don't think that pulling it locally will help in most, like in most cases. If you're digging into mm -hmm. the code, yes, okay. But it is rare in these reviews that digging into the code is what you are reviewing. Yeah. Um, you know, you're just reviewing text for the most part. Yeah. Um, yeah. And so I, I think it will be much straight more or much more straightforward. Yeah. Alternatively, we just add both options in the in the manual. Oh, yeah. And then, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like whichever one you prefer, whichever one works better for you, kind of thing. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, in the okay. end, though, you need to make your comments on GitHub. So I think we need yeah. to teach them how to do that yeah yeah for sure so, yeah <laughs> and i guess that is the last part of it um well, i think i have to go to the actual commit oh no uh yeah i think i have to go to the commit what are you yeah. trying to do just to actually never... commit it <laughs> oh to it so i would let's let's not do that actually well, do that it now is, it is it's better so yeah go ahead yeah. you do you go yeah. to um Files. Oh, okay, yeah, that works. And yeah. you'll say, yeah, go ahead. <laughs> Thanks, Gabby. And then you approve and submit review. And then also, I believe there's one more step and merge pull requests. Wait, oh, wait, wait, wait. Cancel. Oh, oh cancel. Uh -oh. What happened? Uh, hit the down arrow there and which, I mean, it doesn't actually matter in this case, but we do squash and merge, which means if she had 10 commits, it goes in as one commit. Ah, okay. Squash and merge. I learned something new. Okay. And, and click that and confirm. We're good to go, right? Yep. yep. Okay. I think everything you've ever worked on, it's been at least the second time, you know, it's there, it, you haven't done the first pull request and therefore mm -hmm. it's set to that automatically. For that mm. repository at that point. Yeah. 
okay anyway so, yeah and there we go so now if you go to the actions tab we can see that it will be uh rebuilding the book with her changes so sweet okay and so yeah so it's still a work in progress and potentially i guess i might come back to another project club to show more <laughs> of the finished project once i actually have stuff in this <laughs> um but yeah thanks awesome oh and it is a little after one so yes yeah let's uh go ahead and we can um wrap it up there Thank you both okay. for your projects and, you know, I'll see everyone at various times, but uh, yeah. definitely see everyone next month for, yeah. uh, it'll be like right around um, posit count time. So yeah. who knows? <laughs> <laughs> and I'm okay with, um, I know you're mentioning whether or not you want to post this. I'm okay with posting it if this is, or if you think it's postable, whichever. Um, yeah, I think I think we did fine. So sure. All right, I'm gonna go ahead.